I want to welcome you to the 33rd oral history taping. It is Tuesday, June the 9th, 2015, and we are going to continue our series about West Melton businesses. Our first speaker is Robert Johnston. Thank you, Barb. You're welcome. Um, I am Robert Johnston. Uh, I grew up in West Milton. Uh, I graduated from the class of 1971 at Milton High School. I uh, went to college and law school and passed the bar exam in the fall of 1978. Uh, currently, I'm the senior partner at the law firm of Shipman, Dixon, and Livingston, uh, which was formed in 1994. Uh, prior to that, and at the time we moved uh, to West Milton, uh, we were Livingston, Sell, and Johnston, including uh, my partners Jim Livingston and Chuck Sell. Uh, we moved here to 316 South Miami Street in uh, the spring of 1982. We purchased uh, the law firm of Kay Wagner, who had taken a position as the first magistrate in the Miami County probate court system. So we have been at that location for uh, a little more than 33 years now. Um, for the first 25 years, Bernadine Blackburn was my secretary, and when she retired, uh, uh, Tara Brandon has been there, and now it has been almost 21 years that Tara has been there. Uh, Kay left, like I said, in 82, and uh, subsequently was elected judge of probate court, and she has now retired. Uh, Kay was actually in the same office we're in, it was a ha it's half a double, and th that building was owned and actually was built on that site by uh, John Queen. Some of you may remember he had a coin shop there, Royal Coin, as I recall. Uh, and after the, uh, we put the law practice in there, he and his wife actually lived in the other half of the building for several years. It was built on the site of the old... Um, Mass Lightning Rod Company. Uh, John had told me he tore down a barn when he built this house, and he actually had quite a collection of um, Mass Lightning Rod uh, uh, paraphernalia, the the metal or the glass balls. He actually had the sign that was in the barn that that talked about the Mass Lightning Rod Company. Uh, when he moved away, I want I wanted that, and he didn't want to let go of it at the time. Uh, I've I reached out to his family, but. Uh, it would be nice to have those those artifacts back. Um, we then acquired the entire building around 1988, and for a long time, Marshall Dillon was in the other side of the building with the, his nationwide insurance business, and we now have uh, uh, the realty company is there, and they've been there several years. Um, since... Uh, 1985 or so, I, I forget the exact date, our firm has been the law director for the village of West Milton. Uh, primarily during that time, it was Chuck, Chuck Sell, uh, for a little more than 30 years, actually, and currently is now Lene Brosh. Um, I tried for a little bit to recount the number of city managers, police chiefs, mayors, council members, but the list is just was too long, and I forgot a couple of some uh, some of the city managers. Uh, the real constant throughout that time was Chuck, however, and uh, he he spent a lot of time with the village and 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 local government uh, here in in West Milton. Um, we also represent the village of Lara, the village of Potsdam on municipal matters. Uh, our Troy office has represented the city of Troy now, entering its 43rd year as law director for the city of Troy. Um, we prosecute all traffic and, and misdemeanor cases in the Miami County Municipal Court that originate from West Milton, Troy, Uber Heights, Pleasant Hill, Bradford, and all Ohio State Patrol and Sheriff's cases throughout Miami County. Uh, we have four part-time prosecutors in municipal court. Last year, that amounted to plus or minus 23,000 cases were, went through the municipal court system. Um, our current office is Jim Livingston is the Troy Law Director. Uh, myself, uh, my son Andrew joined the firm uh, four years ago. Uh, Grant Kerber, uh, Lene Brosh, and we've added a, um, a, a lady by the name of Katie Wall. Um, 
our prior partner, Greg Dixon, is now the sitting probate juvenile judge in Miami County. Um, and really, that's, that's our history. I should add that uh, during that period of time, uh, Winifred Martindale, when we first started, had a practice, and, and we acquired his cases when Mr. Martindale passed away. Uh, Alan Wagner has since retired, and we have acquired uh, some of his old files. So at the current time, um, one of our former members, Brandon Code, has opened an office in, in West Milton, but for a long time we've been the only law firm in town. Um, that's good and that's bad, I suppose. <laughs> but uh, it's been good. We've been very happy here. Um, I, I am here the, primarily, but uh, all the lawyers take a little bit of a turn in terms of being present at the office. So um, I... I'm sure that even uh, when I retire, we'll keep a presence here when, with one of the other lawyers. So it would be great if a couple more fellas or ladies decided to open an office in town, but um, maybe that's, uh, maybe it's just not quite ready for that yet. So that's all I got. Oh, and immediately to my right is Larry Diaz. He's not only a uh, Next to me here, he's my neighbor on Miami Street as well, so Larry Diaz. Thank you. I was going to say it's appropriate that, uh, that I'm next because we are neighbors. Uh, the, uh, our address is 326 South Miami Street, and we're separated by Farmer's Alley, right? Farmer's Alley. Uh, I formed a business uh, called Law Science Technologies uh, back in 1981, and Law Science... Uh, Technologies, as the name suggests, combines science with law. Uh, we apply the laws and principles of science to technical matters within the uh, uh, criminal and civil justice system. Um, some, some of us may know it as forensic science. Um, just a little background about myself. I, um, I uh, my terminal degree was a master's degree in in biochemistry from Wright State Uni University. And after I, I obtained that degree, I realized it was probably going to have to go to work and support the family. So uh, uh, I um, found, a, found a job uh, with the Miami Valley Regional Crime Laboratory in Dayton, which is a um, full service police crime laboratory, and worked there for uh, 10 years. And um, and I was the uh, the leading forensic scientist when I when I left, and uh, uh, gained a lot of experience, a lot of training in, in the forensic sciences, um, working there. Uh, during that during that time that I was there, uh, I became to realize that there was a need for forensic science services in the civil uh, aspect of the law. And our, the charter of the, of the Miami Valley Regional Crime Lab did not allow us to, to do work on civil cases. Uh, we only did work on criminal cases. So um, I thought, well, maybe I'll start a, a business on the side. And that's, that's when I founded Law Science Technologies. The uh, first couple years uh, I was operating um, probably illegally out of a room and spare room in my house on J Street and um, quickly out outgrew that and we we then purchased the uh, building at 326 South Miami Street um, I believe I believe that structure was built as a residence and was a residence for many years um, but I think uh, in, before we bought it there had been been a couple businesses in there and I think the Business for me before me was a um, a gentleman that that made jewelry and sold jewelry, um, but I, I I don't don't recall his name. Um, probably most people in town don't know much about uh, our business because we don't do business with people in town, at least not very often, and that's probably a good thing. Um, because when we're the business we're doing, it's it's in a situation where somebody has a problem. Uh, we provide services worldwide. 
the majority of our business is in Southwest Ohio, but we've uh, had, had done work on cases around the world. There are, um, there's, there are several areas that we, that we specialize in. One is in the area of accident reconstruction. Um, it's vehicle, pedestrian, uh, trucks, cars, motorcycles. Um, and uh, I have two people that do that work. I'm not, I don't have uh, expertise in that area, but I have two people, uh, Fred Lickert and Doug Hurd, uh, that are specialists in accident reconstruction. And, um, and, and they do that, that type of work. That work primarily is done for either plaintiff's attorneys, um, um, like Dyer, Garofalo, Mann and Schultz, and all the, uh, all those that fall within that group. And then we also, then they also do work for insurance companies. Um, and that's usually on the, well, sometimes on the defense side and for, for defense attorneys. So that's, uh, that's one area. Second area is fire um, origin and cause investigation. Um, I, that's an area I got into um, when I, when I, uh, after I left the crime lab. Uh, but uh, my middle son, Ben Diaz, came to work with me uh, about 15 years ago after uh, completing his bachelor science degree in fire science uh, and arson technology. So um, he, he does the, the vast majority of the fires. I only do them if, if he gets backed up and, and I'll, um, uh, or, or I'll assist him on a fire that might be hazardous where it's best to have, have two people. Um, the majority of the cases that he does are for insurance companies. And, um, and occasionally we, we get hired by defense attorneys on, on criminal cases, on arson cases, when someone's charged with arson. Um, then Ben is also um, sp uh, spread out and specialized in, in a couple other areas um, uh, for insurance clients, and that is uh, doing roof inspections and moisture um, uh, uh, cause and origin investigations. Um, in this part of the country, there are a lot of, um, a lot of, of course, we have a lot of, a lot of heavy uh, storms, uh, hail, and um, um, there, I'm not sure how to say it, there are many, there are many roofers out there will, that will inspect a roof and will tell the homeowner that you have hail damage or you have wind damage, and then uh, a um, experienced examination of that roof will may may confirm that, or it may show that there's other problems with the roof. So that that's that's what he what he does: the fires and in the, uh, the the roofs, and then also moisture evaluations. Um, I should mention before while I'm talking about personnel, I, I should mention that my our assistant, administrative assistant and sec secretary is Kathy Heil. Uh, she's been with us since about 1984, so um, she's been obviously with us a long time. And then the cases that I do, um, when I left the crime lab, it was my intention to, um, to do work on just civil cases. But then uh, the defense attorneys quickly learned that, um, that there was somebody on the outside that they could call for assistance in in, um, def in, in defending uh, uh, individuals in criminal cases. And um, that kind of, <clears throat> I guess it kind of surprised me. I didn't in in intend to do that. And, and uh, then I had, to, I had to give second thought about doing it because of having worked for the other side for the prosecution for so long um, at, at the Miami Valley Regional Crime Laboratory. But, um, one thing I one thing I quickly learned was um, for the criminal justice system to be balanced, the defense has to have the same opportunities to uh, defend himself, him or herself, that the prosecution has to prosecute themselves. Um, the majority of the criminal cases that I get involved in are, are um, death penalty homicide cases primarily, and um, and. Generally, in those cases, those defendants don't have the money to 
uh, defend themselves. I'm, I'm actually hired, appointed, hired by the court, paid by the court to assist the defense uh, in evaluating the, the evidence. Uh, it's my job to see whether or not I think the crime scene was processed correctly, if the proper evidence was col collected properly, if it was analyzed correctly, and if the interpretation that the state's giving to the court um, is correct. Uh, many times when I review it, I will agree. Occasionally there are times that I will disagree. If I disagree, then usually I'm, I'm testifying. So um, um, that's, that's the majority of the work that I do. And I believe that pretty well concludes uh, what, what I wanted to say, and I'm happy then to pass uh, the process on to Karen Callahan. Thank you. Yes. Very interesting. Thank we you. learned a lot. Thank you. Uh, I'm Karen Callahan. I am the owner of Really Cool Stuff. It is a gift shop and gallery located at 5 North Miami Street here in West Milton. Uh, we feature the work of a lot of different regional artists, um, working with lots of consigners who provide things like uh, jewelry, uh, pottery, greedy pottery, uh, fiber art that includes quilted, um, hand-woven and knitted items, photography, painting, collage art, even handcrafted furniture. Uh, plus a whole lot of other stuff too. It's about 50-50 mix of handcrafted items and stuff that I like because it's my shop and I can bring in what I want. <laughs> uh, so we've got some gorgeous glass and beads, kites, uh, greeting cards, incense, uh, some clothing, one of my shirts. Uh, fair trade items and some things from all over the world, Africa, Indonesia, and South America, Russia. So a lot of fun stuff. Um, but it started with beading. Uh, about several years ago, a friend of mine, Vicki Hathaway, convinced me that I should try my hand at making jewelry. And I resisted for a long time thinking, I have enough stuff I don't need to take on another hobby. But, but I started, and I loved it, and I was hooked, and we started producing quite a bit of jewelry, a lot that was sold at a shop called the Stillwater Emporium, which is at, in the same location now where really cool stuff is. Uh, but when the village uh, started the renovation of 48 and closed traffic down entirely for about three months, uh, Eva Garman, who was the owner of Stillwater Emporium, decided that she didn't really want to stay and continue to pay rent on a location that no longer had any foot traffic. So the location became empty, and Vicki and I looked at each other and said, do you want to try this? And I thought, it's crazy, but, you know, why not? So uh, after a couple months' work on painting and renovating, we moved in, and opened in December of 2005, so just about 10 years now. Um, and so we ha it started with beads. We both had huge inventories of beads because of the work we were doing, so we have a lot of beads, um, jewelry that we were both making, but now several other artists also contribute jewelry there as well. Um, and, and a handful of really talented local artists, um, Joyce Kashner, who does hand weaving, this gorgeous hand-woven shawl is one of Joyce's pieces. Uh, Mary Hart, who does gorgeous um, watercolors. Janie Warner does jewelry. Marcia Pippinger does collage art. Cheryl Swartz, another local artist who does just fantastic metalsmith work. It's gorgeous. Everything's gorgeous, isn't it? Uh, um, copper, metal, and other metal jewelry. Um, and they're still with us today. So handful have been with us for a very, very long time. But now we have well over 40 artists, uh, including Becky Hamler, who does beautiful beaded silverware and serving pieces. So um, there's a lot of things. And a lot of artists happy to do custom work. If you need custom jewelry for a prom or a wedding, we're happy to do that. Um, even handcrafted furniture. I mean, we've got a whole range of things. 
It was very difficult in the beginning because Vicki and I were both working full-time jobs. Um, and I, I, at the time, was the uh, development director for the Human Rights Theater Company in downtown Dayton, and I remained there for several years, even after we opened the shop. Um, after a while, Vicki decided she needed to move on to other things, and um, I really had to ask myself if I could continue to do this on my own. And I decided I really wanted to. Um, it was hard work. It really was. I was working two jobs, and it, it uh, took a lot of energy. Um, but I, I always thought of it as an investment, that it would be what I would do after I retired from the theater. Um, and it has worked out that way. Uh, I have retired from the theater company now, and this is my full-time job. And... Uh, so here we are ten, 10 years later. My husband is now officially my partner in the business, um, and I could not be doing this without him. He has been so supportive. Um, he also contributes. He's a wonderful woodworker, and uh, everything from small little ornaments. These are hand-turned ornaments uh, with a Celtic cross, uh, all the way up to furniture, full pieces of furniture, all there in the the shop. Um, also, I have to say thank you, too, to all my consigners who do such a wonderful job helping me. I could not be in doing this job without their help. They really um, are fantastic, and, and in, in addition to producing the, the wonderful pieces of art that are there, um, they, they contribute their time as well and help a great deal. Um, there were a lot of times I thought about, you know, this is not easy. I'm not. Gonna, I'm. I'm ready to stop this, but I've stayed, and I'm glad I have. It's fun, and I'm very, very happy to provide an outlet for the the considerable talents of the local artists. Um, I personally am still making jewelry, a lot of jewelry. I also am making. I don't know if you can see these beaded pens and bottle toppers that are really fun. Uh, metal embossed items, which is kind of unusual. Again, I don't know if you can see this. Larry turns the boxes and I do the metal embossing. <laughs> can you see? <laughs> I do the metal embossing that embellishes the top. Uh, and most recently, I have been doing hand-carved animal figures. Uh, and this is really small, so I doubt that you can see this. But it's a little rabbit. But I've been carving animal figures from alabaster and soapstone. Um, they are all of the animals that are featured in the medicine cards. And that is um, a divination system drawn on the wisdom of American Indian folklore and culture and their observation of the characteristics of animals. So there are 52 animals featured in the medicine cards and I have carved all of them, and I have those there. And that has been my introduction to internet sales. Um, I rec I've had a website for a while, but I uh, recently opened up to internet sales um, because I have something that you can't find anywhere else. Um, there, I, I am not aware of anyone who is producing all of the 52 animals featured in the medicine cards. So uh, I am doing that. That's my introduction to internet sales. The website is www.really-cool-stuff.biz. Um, so I invite you to check us out there. Um, we also have a branch location down at the Loft Theater. Uh, again, that's from my association with the Human Race Theater Company. Um, they asked me to open, and it's a very, very small location compared to the floor space that I have uh, over at the, the shop at, on Miami Street. Um, but it's, it's there at the theater in the loft lobby, um, open when there are plays going on down there. And that's still going on, even though I am no longer working for the theater company. Um, history of the building. Um, what I know, according to um, our local historian, Rachel Minnick, uh, is that the building opened at 
in 1908 as a bank, and if you look at it, it looks like a bank. Uh, I have also heard that it's been a post office. I don't know if that's true or not, but I've heard that. Uh, I know it's been a barber shop, many, many different types of gift shops, and a restaurant uh, where there was a fire in the 70s. Um, the kitchen was on the upper floor, and there was a fire that uh, pretty much gutted that whole second floor. When we opened the shop in 2005, we were just on the first floor, and I always thought it was such a shame that people could not go up and see the gorgeous window and the view from that beautiful window on the second floor. So I talked to my landlord, and he agreed to renovate. Uh, and I was very, very happy about that, except for the fact that while it doubled my floor space, it also doubled my overhead at a time when the economy just was really sinking. And so it made a difficult time even more difficult. Um, but in the end, I'm very glad we did it. Uh, and it's really beautiful. And I invite you all to come up and see it. Um, it, it is where we have most of the gallery space for larger items. We're also able to hold classes and uh, activities up there. Um, at first, I was trying to really promote it as a classroom space, and I was spending a lot of time and effort scheduling classes, promoting them, mailing flyers out, only to have to cancel them because it wasn't getting enough participation. Um, so now the deal is, and if you go to our, my website, you will see the list of artists who are willing, and, and instructors who are willing to conduct a class. Uh, but now people have to come to me and say, I've got three friends and we'd like to do a, a class in beading. Can you help us do that? And, and I absolutely can. And there's a whole list of things from beading to photography to belly dancing. I mean, it's, it's crazy. There, there's a lot of things. So check out that list. And if there's something that interests you and you can get a group of people together, I'm happy to help facilitate that. Um, the only other recurring activity that we have now is uh, called Sacred Circle. It happens the first Tuesday of every other month. The next one will be August 4th. That is with Diana Rankin. Um, it's a wonderful activity, and I, again, I invite you to go to the website and find out more about that. Uh, we did have yoga and uh, stopped that for lack of participation, but we'd like to start that again. So if you're interested in yoga, let me know that. Um, so there's a lot going on, and a lot of really cool stuff. <laughs> um, no, our, pun no, no, no pun at all. Um, our hours are Tuesday through Friday, 11 to 6, Saturday, 11 to 5, closed on, on uh, Sundays and Mondays. So please stop by and see what we've got, see what we're all about. And now, Brian Rudy. Thank you. Thanks, Karen. Um, as Karen was speaking, uh, it, it was really, well, it was really cool. First of all, <laughs> second of all, <laughs> second of all, it, it's nice to know that that, that the entrepreneurial spirit um, lives on in West Milton. I think that's that is really cool. And that's really neat. So thank you for that. Yeah. Um, thanks for having me today. Uh, my name is Brian Rudy. I'm um, uh, I represent the fifth generation of Rudy Incorporated. Uh, we've been in business since 1904. Uh, my great-great-grandfather by the name of S.J. or Samuel James Rudy started uh, the business under the Rudy name. Um, it's a long time. I mean, 111 years uh, for a family business to, um, to stay around and, 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 and be, uh, well, produce revenue and be somewhat profitable is, is uh, quite an undertaking and an accomplishment that we're very proud of. Uh, it's, it's pretty steeped in tradition from that st standpoint. Um, so we appreciate that, and then we also appreciate the fact that it's, uh, it's customer loyalty uh, through the years that have, ha has enabled us, us to do that. Um, I, I find myself doing business with um, the grandsons of, of, of many people that my, my grandfather you know, did business with. So it's generational, um, so it's kind of refreshing from that standpoint, the, uh, the whole grassroots America type deal. Uh, but as I said, it was established in 1904 under the name S.J. Rudy and Sons. Um, in uh, November of 1960, uh, Don Faulkner um, built and operated the elevator here in West Milton. Now, prior to that, there was uh, an existing elevator, but it was more of a feed mill, and it was located um, to the south end of, of the lot where a warehouse exists today when the railhouse went through. 
So that was probably circa 30, 1940, sometime at that point in time. But in the 60s, Don came along and decided he had a greater vision, and he came along and built what is now the concrete house that you see today under our name. Um, it was the summer of 1985 that, that my family came in and did purchase um, I did purchase uh, 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 the, uh, the elevator from the Faulkner family um, and uh, began to operate it as uh, a feed mill, uh, grain elevator, a place for farmers to bring their, their product and um, you know, uh, um, provide them a market and um, also provide them with uh, merchandising advice uh, for their crops. Uh, the summer of 1989, um, uh, my uncle Bill um, was managing the, the West Milton facility at the time, and he was instrumental in bringing um, the uh, Country Express drive through business to West Milton. Some of you may remember that there was a time when uh, there was a drive through that existed that did not sell lottery tickets, did not sell <laughs> beer, and did not sell cigarettes. <laughs> In fact, uh, it was for uh, farm supplies. Uh, we, we sold uh, bag feed, um, all kinds of knickknacks, um, not really cool stuff, but some kind of <laughs> cool stuff. And um, that went on for a number of years. But um, since then, uh, you know, we, we at that point in time were, were doing grain and we're doing feed and we're doing fertilizer and chemical and, and realized at, at a certain point that we couldn't be all things to all people. Um, since we've we've uh, taken over the property from the Faulkner family, we've we've roughly doubled the storage capacity in West Milton. Uh, we're I think we're licensed at somewhere around 500,000 bushel storage. Um, but in the winter of 2008, um, uh, what what is now Rudy Incorporated um, went to a grain only operation. So what we do is we buy, sell, and trade corn, wheat, and soybeans. That is what we do. Um, the old adage, buy low, sell high, uh, as simple as it may sound, uh, that's what we try to do, and it's not always that easy. Um, but we do appreciate all the lo loyal far farmer support that we get, and, uh, you know, we've considered it a privilege doing business here in this community. It's it, We have a great group of guys that we do business with, and we wouldn't be around without them, so we appreciate that. Um, March of 2009, we uh, constructed a new corporate office uh, in, in Covington, which is where I actually work, but I do try to make it down here from time to time. Uh, it, but then in the summer of 2014, so just last year, um, here down at West Milton, we, we had an operations project. And, and what we did was, many of you might have noticed a, a rather large crane <laughs> this year. It was, yeah, it was huge. It was about 158 foot tall, and I think the boom on it was somewhere around 170 feet long. And it was substantial, yeah. When, when they told me they needed to build the crane, I, <laughs> it should have dawned on me at that point in time what we were in for. It was a, it was a big project. But what we did was we essentially um, more than tripled our, our intake capacity, which means our ability to to uh, dump trucks in a, an expedient fashion, you know, has has increased threefold, at least actually. And what that's going to do throughout the next several years, hopefully, is is to ease some of that harvest congestion that you see out on 571. And four. I mean, I know it gets. Bear with us. I mean, it's only two or three months a year, but but it's big. It's big. So what? what the idea is to get people on and off the lot quickly or uh, quicker, and also to just better service our existing customer base. It was it was long overdue, but it was something that we took on, and and, and we wanted to do it do it uh, do it to the best of our ability, and and basically. Uh, uh, do it the right way. So um, that was completed um, just prior to fall kicking off last year uh, in, in uh, mid-September. And um, that's where we are today. So uh, many things have happened through the years. And I, I really, I don't have time to, to go through all the nitty gritty, but I do have some props here, which is kind of fun. Uh, so like many of you, or some of you might remember, or maybe your parents might remember, um, when we carried around things like this, this is a coin purse, actually, um, when, you know, like a quarter mattered. <laughs> and you could actually had some purchasing power. Um, now things that jingle, not so much. Um, this is one of my personal favorites. It, uh, it's actually a, kind of a, a gimmicky type item, but I really like it from a marketing standpoint. Um, it says, this side will sharpen your memory. The other side will sharpen your knife. Uh, as J. Rudy and Sons. So the, here's the top, and then, of course, the backside is uh, a knife sharpener for uh, 
well, the pocket knives that people used to carry around. <laughs> so things have changed. Uh, remember pencils? Yeah. yeah, this was a pencil. So, yeah, what we used to work with. And then we've, we've evolved from things like this, which is a grain scale book that we used to work out with now, to things like this, to where we, we text our grain quotes to our, our customers every day, 3.32 p.m. Sign up for a text message service. Uh, hats. Many of you might remember these red Rudy hats that were, you know, around the neighborhood back maybe 30 or 40 years ago. Kind of different now, but still the same. Um, so at any rate, it, it's steeped in tradition. Uh, we're happy to be here. We're here because uh, of the loyalty from the West Milton community, which we, which we continue to appreciate. And um, that is, uh, I think, pretty much I have. Uh, appreciate you having me today. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Craig Coates. Thank, thank you, Brian. I'm Craig Coat with Coat Concrete Products. Coat, Coat Concrete Products has been in business for 90 years. It was established in 1925 by my grandfather, Cecil Coat. He had three sons involved in the business until their retirement in the 1970s. Burial vaults early on were the primary products manufactured throughout the 90 years, have been sold through funeral homes in southwest Ohio and eastern Indiana. Imagine starting a business just prior to the Depression and trying to acquire materials to remain open had to be a real challenge. Uh, my respect grows constantly for them, those generations. In the early 1950s, with the housing boom, the company expanded into making septic tanks and home aerobic aeration systems, and the business grew sizably. And it and at that continued for three decades, six, the 60s, 70s, 80s, from time to time with a slowdown due to the economy and housing. Additional product lines over the last 25 years are continuing to grow, due in part to governmental regulations. The products now, it, it's, it just fascinates me. I've been there so long, and, and it, it's just interesting, the, the things that, that are required today of people to purchase that weren't just 20 years ago. Grease interceptors for restaurants. Uh, a lot of people in West Milton don't realize a lot of the things we produce, but the restaurant business, as we all know, is an ongoing good business, uh, building restaurants constantly. Well, we sell grease traps for a lot of those restaurants, or grease interceptors. Oil interceptors that are close to follow behind grease interceptors are things that are used in industrial buildings and garage floors. Another thing that wasn't required some years ago now it's, 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 you either do it or you don't open. Uh, lift stations, this is something that's come about in the last, especially the last 10 years. Lift stations are tank, concrete tanks that you put behind people's houses where you have to lift the water into mound systems, something that's, that's fairly new on the market today. We will, we'll get the call and we'll, these lift stations, they'll size-wise, they'll be three to 500 gallons up to 1,000, and for that matter, even larger. And we'll deliver the tanks like you would a normal septic tank, but after that's done, you, you have to go back at a later date and install pumps, sometimes single pumps, sometimes two pumps, sometimes with autom automated control panels. Uh, it's, really become, it's really become a... a a good line in our business and then we produce sewage systems which we have for years uh, primarily our sewage systems now go in eastern well in Kentucky a lot of a lot of the jobs are in eastern Kentucky and a lot of them for, are for schools sanitary and storm manholes for municipalities and catch basins that's another line that, that's that's growing uh, to our advantage, we've lost some of our competitors over the last few years. They just gave up and, and, and quit, the, which they, the customers have to go somewhere, so, so they call coat. Uh, this is another thing, septic tank access risers. To a lot of people, that don't mean anything, but we sell those things by the hundreds anymore. Used to be we didn't have walk-in business. We're, like, we're not like a normal retail. We've become that way. Saturday mornings, we get people just 
walking in the doors needing to purchase access risers for their tanks. And they, when they come in, I'll ask them, I say, I'll, I'll bet you're from Dark County. And they'll say, yeah, how'd you know? <laughs> uh, the reason is, is the health departments, health inspectors, uh, they're out, they're walking through yards. I mean, that's literally what they do today. They walk through yards and, and require the homeowners to purchase those concrete risers, which is, it's a good business for us. The people that come in the door, they'll say, we, you can't buy these anywhere else. Well, I say, that's music to my ears. <laughs> Uh, it's 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 really it, it's an ongoing business, and we we thank the great bureaucracy for a lot of this. They they send <laughs> they they send them our way. Uh, we I, I mean I could go on. There's there's we have a lot of history as you can tell in 90 years, a lot of it would probably bore you. Uh, but looking forward, uh, the opportunity remains. Uh, who knows? The fourth generation's on board now. Uh, we could be good for another 90 years. Uh, that's, that's all I have right now. I turn this over to Mark Hamler. Thank you, Craig. Uh, I think I can speak for everyone here, but uh, I think we've all been good corporate citizens throughout the years, and I think we owe all the, the uh, thank you to the community for uh, supporting our businesses. Uh, I am Mark Hamler of Hamler Gingrich Insurance, and our business started in 1927. Uh, by George, <coughs> excuse me, George Woodfield, and I believe he was at 13 North Miami Street, if I'm not mistaken. Um, in 19, I don't know exactly when, I think it was 1940-ish, uh, Bob Kraus bought the George Woodfield Agency, and he stayed there at 13, and then in 1958, my father Tom purchased the business from Bob Kraus, and in 1960, moved to 21 North Miami Street, where Cliff Poling is today. Uh, in 1968, thereabouts, uh, Russ Dillon came to work with my father. And in 1972, Don Fisher joined the agency. And in 1977, I joined the agency at the same time Russ Dillon retired. Um, so Don and I were in business for over 30 years together, and in 1988, we moved from 21 North Miami Street to 102 North Miami Street, uh, which for those of you who don't know, uh, McDonald's is across the street from us because we were there first. So <laughs> I didn't know if anyone remembered that or not. But um, <laughs> So uh, we moved, and I believe it was 1988 to uh, uh, 102 North Miami Street. Uh, in 2005, I was joined by Matt Gingrich, and a year later, Don Fisher retired. And then, like so many people here, uh, in uh, December, last December, my son Kurt joined the agency. So we are now a third generation uh, business, which I think is good for the community and, and good for the longevity of the business, as, as Brian alluded to. Um, our business is a property and casualty insurance. We do also offer life and health insurance, but we're primarily property and casualty. Uh, I'm happy to say that since I joined the business in 1977, we have grown in excess of 10 times. So that's kind of nice. Pat myself on the back there. No, um, but, and I owe that all to inflation partially, but uh, <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> but I owe that to all. We have a wonderful staff, and we've had, I, I can't go through all the, uh, the help we've had, but uh, we've always had uh, excellent uh, staff in our, in our operation. Uh, just two years ago, we purchased uh, an agency over in Tip City, favorite insurance agency. So we now have an office over in Tip City at 115 Tippecanoe Drive. And uh, a little history, as, as many of you know, uh, I mentioned where we were, but um, there's been several different businesses and all those uh, uh, locations, but the place where we are now obviously was the Milton Federal, the old Milton Federal Savings and Loan, and we purchased that from Bill Williams, who had purchased that from um, Cleet Minnick and Milton Federal Savings and Loan, and Bill Williams had an interior design business in, in that location, so when we bought it, it had shag carpet, 
it <laughs> it had uh, hooks on the wall where you could he could put displays and whatnot. So we have changed that. I don't know if I'd say dramatically, but we definitely changed the carpet. Um, <laughs> but uh, then uh, the other 21, yeah, like I say, cliff polling was there. And I have fond memories when, when uh, I worked at 21 North Miami Street, Kenny's Drugs was next door. Or, and uh, Walt Stockslager and um, Jim Karsh were the pharmacist in there and you'd always walk through the drugstore to go to the instead of if especially it was raining you'd walk through the drugstore instead of you know walking down the alleyway so that was that was just fond memories I have of, of uh, being in in uh, 21 North Miami Street but uh, other than that uh, I love working with I well I didn't mention myself I graduated like many of the people here graduated uh, from West Milton I went to school at uh, the College of Insurance in New York City. I lived in Brooklyn Heights during that time and had a great education, not only from schooling, but living in New York City. Um, and uh, I, I did not enjoy living the city life, so I am very happy to be back where the grass is green and the air smells like air instead of other things. Uh, but uh, I do enjoy living in West Milton and I'm proud to be a part of the uh, community. So with that said, I would like to turn the program over to Jordan Seiler. Hi, thanks for having me. Uh, my name is Jordan Seiler and I'm here representing Jolene Sell, the owner of the Brick House Cafe in West Milton. Um, a little bit of history about the building. Although Jolene opened in 2005, um, the building formerly was the West Milton Record Office. In 1902, the record was purchased by Charles and Tom Radabaugh. They bought it from T.A. Greenville. Um, we talked to uh, Mr. K. Wirtz, the owner of Wirtz's Variety Store and the hardware store, and he recalls delivering newspapers for a nickel an hour. Um, Mary L. Gordon was the editor and co-publisher of the West Milton Record from 1929 to 1965. Um, but she did begin with the record in 1911 as a hand compositor when the newspaper was owned by Tom and Charles. Um, her and her partner, Cecile Hodgen, sold the record in 1965 to Vernon T. Bowling of the Bowling Mormon newspaper in Tip City. Um, at the time of sale, she wrote, after having served and lived in the community over this period of time, we feel the community is a part of us and we are a part of it. We are interested in its advancement and ready to give it publicity. Happy when events are pleasant and share with those in grief. Um, in a lot of ways, Jolene has carried on her thoughts, um, Mary's thoughts, with her hometown style restaurant and um, even on the window when you go eat there, it says a little place to chat. Um, Jolene opened the Brick House Cafe in 2005 with the, with the help of her two friends, Carolyn Livingston and Peg Moore. Jolene Sell, or formerly known as Jolene Johnson, um, is a graduate of Milton Union High School um, from 1976. Um, she purchased the Brick House Cafe. It was formerly known as Java Mamas. It closed um, while she was searching for a certified kitchen to um, do her catering for the willow tree for weddings. So it was a happy coincidence that the kitchen was available. Um, in the Brickhouse's early years, they only offered donuts, coffees, and pre-made sandwiches. But as her business grew, she opened up to a full breakfast and full lunch menu. Um, uh, the cafe seats 42 people and currently offers homemade sandwiches, soups, salads, desserts, and coffee and daily specials. Um, when you come eat at the Brick House Cafe, you'll notice that the printer's cabinets from the West Milton Record are still there and being used today. And um, it still says the West Milton Record on the window. Um, the Brick House Cafe runs on only seven employees, so everybody works very hard to keep it going. And um, the Brick House Cafe is supported by a lot of regulars that we see every day. We know a lot of them by name. 
and um, a lot of them will come in and help themselves to their own coffee and um, we'll have their order cooking before the bell even jingles when they open the door. Um, for some customers, we even offer curbside service because they're VIP, I guess. Um, and then um, some of this history that we had about the building was offered by Rachel Ann Minnick, who's another one of our regulars that we see every day. She gave us this picture of the building. Um, this is the, when it was the West, West Milton Record Office. kind of looks the same. They've kept it a lot the same. Um, a funny story, what um, Jolene recalls is during a winter storm, she told all of her employees, don't bother coming in today. We won't be busy. And um, she ended up being very busy, of course. So she ended up having customers come back in the kitchen and cook their own food and wait on themselves. <laughs> so a lot of the time, customers and employees at the Brick House Cafe are treated like family and it's a good, it's a hometown place. Yeah. Um, that's all she has, so I'm going to turn it over to Mark Cropland. Thank you, Jordan. I'm Mark Cropland. I'm the owner of Cropland Jewelers. And uh, I guess I'm a graduate of Milton Union, so I've grown up here in this town. i um, 57 years old, so I really never left. I got here and never left. But. Uh, to explain how I got here, uh, I need to go back about 57 years when my dad started Cropland Jewelers. Um, he had a cousin that was interested, that actually was a, a watchmaker and was in, in the jewelry business. And he uh, had some influence on my dad, and my dad decided that hey, that's what he was going to do. So he, as, when he graduated from Phillipsburg High School, uh, he went to Watchmakers College in Cincinnati. And it was called Fogler's Institute. And uh, he went down there and uh, took him about a year and a half to get through the watchmaking school. And he graduated. And then he enlisted into the Air Force and went into the Air Force for four years out in Salina, Kansas. And uh, he repaired watches on the side. He put his watch, but he had a little trailer that my mom, he had gotten married while he was in Salina. And the trailer was, you know, I don't know, maybe 10, 12 feet long, I don't know, wasn't very big. But somehow he squeezed a watch bench into that trailer. I think he cut part of the bed out and stuck his watch bench in there and contracted work from area jewelers around Salina and that's what he did on the side. So he did that for four years and honed his craft a little bit and then came on home. And uh, so he started looking around for jewelry stores. That's what he wanted to do. He wanted to own a business. So he began to look around for stores. He worked at, uh, for area stores in the meantime. He worked for Rikes in, in Dayton. He worked for uh, a jeweler in Greenville, a jeweler in, in Troy, and, and did their watch repairs for him. So uh, as time went on, it, it so happened that a store in West Milton became available. Uh, before that, he went into a, uh, a manufacturing jeweler in Cincinnati, and he he was maybe 22, 23, 24, something like that. He had been about 25, I guess, because he was out of the service. And he said, sir, do you know of any jewelry stores for sale? And the guy looked at him and laughed and said, son, they're all for sale. <laughs> uh, well, my dad walked out and, and wasn't feeling real, you know, big about that. Quit, but, you know, so anyway, he came back to West Milton. But uh, uh, the st a store came, became available. It was called uh, Fleming's Watch Shop. And uh, I, I really don't know how long Mr. F Wendy Fleming was there, but I believe he was there from 1950 up to 1957, but I, I don't know that for certain. The history of the store before that, I, I really don't know. If, if he purchased the store from someone, I really need to catch up on that. But uh, uh, that's, that's how my dad got into business in West Milton. So, uh, he bought the store from Wendy in 1957, and the store at that time was located uh, pretty much ac directly across. It was on, on North and, and Miami Street, pretty much uh, right across from your place, Mark, Mark Hamler's Insurance. And at that time, I believe there was a Brown's 
grocery store there. That I, I believe was there for a, quite a long time. I've seen pictures of it going way back, so I, I, it, it was an old store. But he had just a very small little corner room, and I, I don't know the situation in that building, but he had enough room for about two showcases and his watch bench, and that was about it. So uh, he stayed there. He, he stayed for three years in that location. And then he had an opportunity to move what he said was Center City. He said he moved up from one. Uh, so that was a big move, very strategic. Uh, so what happened was Louis Moore, uh, who owned a shoe store, I guess he probably retired, and uh, that became available. So dad. Uh, got his safe on some rollers and they closed the street down 48 and they rolled it right out of the store and right, rolled it down 48 and rolled it back into the new store and that's that's pretty much what happened so um, he rented there from he was there and, and by the way right after he moved I think it was like three months later that store that he was in burnt to the ground and my mom said he she's never seen he, at that time we lived on Hamilton Street um, that's where I was there from one to three years old, and then we moved out to, a, to our other house. But uh, he saw the smoke coming up, and, you know, he, she said he, she never saw him get out of bed so fast because he thought maybe his building was burning down, but it was, it was the grocery store where he was three months earlier. So, uh, but anyhow, then he, he went down and, and moved in there, and he rented uh, the building, and I believe that Harlan Dixon owned the building, but I could be wrong on that. But uh, he rented there from 1960 until 68, and then the building went up for sale, and my dad bought that property, and that is where the Pearson House restaurant is now. But we're, we're in a north uh, small area, just north, on the north side of the building, excuse me, south side of the building, and uh, um, so he bought the property, and that's pretty much where we've been ever since, since 1960. Um, now, the history of that property, we could go talk a long time about that, but at that time, there was Mabel's uh, dress shop was in there and when he moved in, and I really don't know if there was anything else in there at the time. So uh, in the meantime, he was there for, oh, I don't know, 25 years plus and uh, at that time I was I went ahead and went on to college and got a, a degree in business and when I got out I wanted to get into business myself so I went around to the area jewelry stores and talked to all the jewelers around the this whole area and, and felt you know tried to get a gauge on what was going on and they were all very encouraging so I decided that that that's what I would do so I went into business with my dad and worked for him for about two to three years. And in the meantime, I went to Gemological Institute of America and I got a, uh, I was certified in diamonds and diamond grading. And then I went and got a master's degree in management, in business management. Um, and then from there, um, two or three years later, I ended up purchasing the store from my dad and I bought the property and, and the store all all together and um, so that happened back in about 1984 so that means I've been there for 30 plus years um, what do we do well we're, we're a jewelry store and we're I would call call us a full service jewelry store and we always have been we've always repaired watches clocks jewelry repair engraving remounting uh, 57 years you name it we've probably done it at one time or another so that's what we've been about for the last 57 years the the uh, you know the Pearson house restaurant is there now beside me um, they've remodeled their their store it's really really beautiful they've really restored and brought back the uh, the feeling and the ambiance of what that place was like when it was a hotel which I would have loved to have seen uh, in its day. I think it was probably really, really a nice hotel for its, you know, for a small town like that. Um, so, 
right now, uh, as far as the billings concerns, it's we have the Pearson House and us, and then upstairs we have apartments. I can't really think of anything else I want to say about it right now, so um, I guess that ends my presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else have anything to add? Yeah. Um, also, I wanted to let everyone know that on July 9th, um, Jolene Sell will be opening the Brick House for dinner. Ah. Yeah. So she will have a full service bar as well. She has um, received a liquor license, so she'll have mixed drinks and appetizers to add to her pre existing menu. Good. Excellent. What were the sons' names of the, of the coats? Ned was one. I'll go from the orders of Bob, Ned, and Leonard. Okay. Mm -hmm. I, I remember all of them. Yeah, but I'm sure. Yeah. I'm sure. I, I have just a couple things. Though. Yes, go ahead. Um, it's too bad there's not somebody today that could talk about some of the businesses that were there when we grew up and are out of business now. Uh, because you just mentioned Harlan Dixon, right. and I'm thinking of Don and Dix. Don and Dix. Yeah. Right. And there's some real stories that could be associated with that. Right. Um, <laughs> Coats for years, for everybody that ever played baseball in town, had Coats All-Stars. We all had a uniform that said Coats Septic System on the back, I think. Yeah, <laughs> yeah what it uh, But that was always big. That um, was a huge deal. Mark Hamler, is, uh, girls that worked in there, uh, refused to sell me a motorcycle insurance one time. <laughs> they thought it was too dangerous. They, <laughs> they probably saved your life, Bob. <laughs> I'm sure Becky Beams thinks that she yeah. did just, yeah. <laughs> So, and, and there were a handful of stores uptown that really, I mean, the Western Auto Store, uh, Harold Houston, uh, yeah. you know, they, Harold went out of business too. Um, who was the other jeweler in town? Montgomery. Montgomery. Jake Montgomery. Jake Montgomery. He, I, I yeah. believe he was there when my dad got came in. Uh, yes. So And Yunt's Shoes. Was he? Yunt Shoes. And, so, yeah. Yunt's. Uh, Howard, Howard Howard Yunt. Yeah. It's too bad none of the Andersons are here from the, the barbershop. That's right. Uh, so, there's been a lot of really good people. Work up, work up town. Uh, Joel Walker always tells a story. There was a uh, a sold appliances or, or uh, Miller's department, some sort of department. Yeah, Miller's department. Store. And, oh, yeah. and when yeah. they had, uh, they were the first per person that actually had a uh, black and white television set. Mm -hmm. And Joel said the first time he ever saw TV, they walked uptown, and the guy, the owner, would turn the TV on at night on either for whatever night the fights were on. Mm -hmm. And he said there would be 10, 15, 20 men standing around and would watch the boxing matches through the store window on this little black and white TV set. So mm -hmm. that's and the first thing we did as a kid when we'd visit the store, we'd run the first thing he did was hand us a nickel, and we'd run down to Max Lair's. Exactly place and get a popsicle uh, he was there and then Some we went over time. over across the street and bought our clothing our, our shoes and our belts and our pants from mr. Yunt yes mm -hmm. yes Howard Howard, Howard Yunt, Howard Yunt. Mm -hmm. and how many people we used to have three auto dealerships mm -hmm. wow. had McGraw's yeah. yep. Ezel and Norris, Norris. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. so that's I mean for a small town it's something to have have yeah. had three Auto dealerships. And Jack, 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 Jack Evans. Evans. Yeah, no, that's right. he had the last. Wow. He had the last kick nickel coke machine in West Milton. Oh, is that right? <laughs> mm -hmm. His his place was there. Well, well, McGraw, right next to, right next to you. Right? Yeah, right. Yeah. But that didn't McGraw and he weren't they partners before McGraw went over to Troy? I thought he and Jack Evans were. Uh, no, I don't think I don't think Bill McGraw was. He Jack Bill McGraw Christ, was Jack right here, wasn't he? Chrysler's. He was a Chrysler London dealer. No, Zell was here. Yeah, after McGraw, I think. Bon oh, Bonnery oh, Zell. Bonnery Zell was here, yes. but I, th I think Bill okay. McGraw was in business right here. Oh, right here? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. I just remember Bonnery Zell being here. Me too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Me too. Right. Mm -hmm. Anything else? Shades. Don't forget Jim. I was going to say, Kenny, Kenny. Don't forget Kenny and Jim Chick. Dickie's laundromat. Shade. Dickie's laundromat. Oh, that's yeah. right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I remember all of that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Does that tell how old I am? <laughs> Dang. As Mark was, was talking and brought back memory um, about his dad, when I first went into business, I was trying to find um, errors and in omission insurance because, you know, I'm working for attorneys and I know I'm going to get sued at some point. <laughs> so, uh, uh, 
I remember his dad, at that time he was in the office where Cliff Poling is, taking me upstairs. His office was way upstairs in the, in the back of the office. And, and um, uh, I don't know how long we talked, but a long, long time he was able to help me out with that particular uh, need. And so uh, I, I remember that very fondly. Sure. Mm -hmm. Telling tales out of school. Mark's dad had a, had a one-way window up there where he could see everyone that was coming in the bag, but they couldn't see him. <laughs> is that right, Mark? That is correct. That's yeah. right. <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you all very, very much. It's been very interesting. We've thoroughly enjoyed it, and we've learned a great deal. So thank you for sharing today. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. thank you. Thanks.